straighten themselves out you know, right about now. Uh, you're, we're on the, we have on the line with us a uh, brother Wutulu Shakur uh, from the, uh, of, who is currently being held in Lompoc prison. Let me tell you something about uh, brother Wutulu Shakur. Brother Wutulu Shakur is a, is a doctor <coughs> of acupuncture. As an acupuncturist and healthcare worker, Brother Shakur worked from 1971 to 78 for the Lincoln Hospital Detoxif Detoxification Program in the Bronx, in New York. And then, from 1978 to uh, 1982, Dr. Shakur was the co-founder and co-director of the Black Acupuncture Advisory Association of North America, and uh, also known as BANA, and the Harlem Institute of Acupuncture. At the Lincoln Detox Center, um, D Dr. Shakur led a program which used ac acupuncture to assist in the detoxification of thousands of drug addicts. The Lincoln Detox program was recognized as the largest and most effective of its kind by the National Institute of Drug Abuse, the Nas National Acupuncture Research Society, and the World Academic Society of Acupuncture. Further, at Bana, uh, Dr. Sh Shakur continued his remarkable work against drug addiction, he also treated and or supervised the treatment of thousands of elderly, elderly and poor patients who other, otherwise would have received no treatment of this kind. P patients were able to receive quality health care at reasonable prices. Moreover, the clinic at Bana served on a regular basis many, communi many community leaders, political activists, lawyers, doctors with various international dignitaries. At Bonner, Dr. Shakur and his co-founder, Dr. Richard Delaney, trained over 100 students in the medical sciences of acupuncture. Some of the trainees at the Harlem Institute of Acupuncture were already ma medical doctors, licensed by various states in the United States. Also in the late 1970s, just to show you about, tell you a little bit about this brother's uh, proficiency in his field, Dr. Dr. Shakur tra traveled with Dr. Mario Wex Wexu. Uh, director of Education at the International Association of Traditional Chinese Acupuncture in Montreal to the People's Republic of China, where he observed and studied acupuncture applied as the primary form of medical care. Dr. Sh he is not, you know, we're not just talking about someone who, you know, dibbles and dabbles in his field, but he's done some serious research, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Brother Shakur also worked with the Revolutionary Action Movement, RAM, in his early years. This was a revolutionary black nationalist organization which struggled for black self-determination and socialist change in America. Brother Dr. Shakur has furthermore been a dedicated worker and champion in the struggle against political imprisonment and political convictions of black activists in America. He has also been a leader in the struggle against the illegal United States and local American law enforcement programs designed to destroy the black movement in America and has worked to expose and stop the secret American war against this black colony. Brother Shakur served on the Committee to Defend H Herman Ferguson, a leading black political activist and educator charged with conspiracy in the Ram Conspiracy case of the 1960s. Dr. Shakur was a member of the National Committee to Free Political Prisoners. He has worked legally to defend, uh, he has worked to legally defend and support political prisoners and prisoners of war like Mario Obadelli, PhD, and the RNA-11, uh, Re Reverend Ben Chavis, and the Wilmington Tins, Ronald Pratt of the Black Panther Party, Asada Shakur of the Black Liberation Army, Sun Sundiata Koli also of the Black Liberation Army. He contributed to the development of a petition to the United Nations by the National Conference of Black Lawyers and others. As a matter of fact, that petition is now documented in the book Illusions of Justice by Lennox Hines. He has also worked with the National Council for Conference of Black Lawyers in developing defense committees for numerous political prisoners and prisoners of war. In addition, and I'm running out of breath with this brother's accomplishments. Brother Shakur was most importantly a co-founder and director of the National Task Force for COINTELPRO Litigation and Research, uh, which investigated, exposed, and instigated suits against the FBI and other American law agencies for criminal acts, domestic spying, dirty tricks, repression, and counterinsurgency warfare maneuvers against the new African independence struggle and others struggling against oppression in America. Now, Having given you this uh, this amazing biography, 
One thing I do have to say before I begin this program is that uh, everything that you hear on this show is not necessarily, you may be surprised to know, not necessarily the, uh, uh, the opinion of the uh, Chicago, University of Chicago or the uh, University of Chicago's Board of Trustees. But uh, having, having said that, I would like to bring on the air Brother Shakur. Brother Shakur, are you with us? Hello? Hello, Brother Shakur. How you doing? Free the land, brother. All right, free the land. Now, Brother Shakur, um, we've just, you know, I, I just read over some of the, some of the things that you've been doing. Uh, you've been uh, a busy, a busy brother, even before, even now that you're, uh, incarcerated. And I'd just like to, uh, I'd like to inquire as to when we look at your accomplishments and we look at what you were doing with acupuncture um, a lot of people first off think hmm acupuncturist hmm uh, how is that how is somebody with acupuncture going to serve in the struggle et cetera et cetera doesn't doesn't uh, usually strike one as the freedom fighter type of thing to do so could you explain to us how acupuncture fed into your struggle for black liberation Yes, Brother Tanya, first of all, I'd like to thank you and the uh, university for allowing me to uh, talk to the uh, south side of Chicago, people I have uh, not had many opportunities to speak to since I've been incarcerated or since I've come up from being clandestine. Um, it's important for us to understand that the struggle for our liberation is a complete process, Brother, and which requires of us to address the causes of our oppression. From that context, uh, I have to say that uh, in the 60s, we had the uh, pleasure of feeling like we were going to be free in 73, you know? That used to be a slogan we would say. Yeah. And as uh, the upheavals and the outrage and the rebellion of the 60s was waged in the struggle between intellectual participation in the movement and the grassroots organizing of the movement began to formulate two lines of the approach to the struggle. Some of us were caught in the uh, in the period of looking at the community being attacked by chemical warfare. Right. And chemical warfare began to change the shape and the attitude of the brothers and sisters who participated in the, uh, what we call then, the revolution. Whether it be the civil rights aspect of integrating into or simulating into America, or whether it be the revolutionary nationalist aspect of fighting for, in that context and in that period, self-determination and or liberation by nationhood. Mm -hmm. So from that point of view, uh, the ability to fight chemical warfare was a significant contribution that many organizations gave to the liberation movement because it was at least a physical uh, participation in, in fighting the ills that the community could still come to the liberation movement for assistance. For example, the Nation of Islam was very instrumental in fighting drug, heroin addiction by having homes and, 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 and uh, clean up houses and sweat out houses all around the country where they could take members of the community who were addicted to drugs and help them cold turkey. So a lot of the nationalist formations and the grassroots formations began to do the same thing. A lot of brothers coming out of the penitentiary because the penitentiary movement was important. Ex-con was not what it was today. An ex-con was an individual who gave character, who established the code of conduct in the community. So they began to set up uh, houses, cold turkey houses and the like, to help deal with the problem of drug addiction. So from the mid-60s to the 70s, the ability to fight heroin and uh, uh, other addictions uh, that was being pushed in our community, that ability to be to do that with the assistance of the liberation formations and our organizations became an important material aid to the community. 
<laughs> in view of that, in New York in particular, and uh, nationally, the National Drug Abuse Conference and, the, and, and Richard Nixon with a Rockefeller implemented into the black community an experiment that they had been experiment a drug that they had been experimenting on for a long period of time in Kentucky, which they had a Lexington, Kentucky experiment program. They implemented what they call a methadone maintenance intervention program. Now, methadone maintenance is a drug that was used allegedly, theoretically, to get a, a, a person off of heroin but onto methadone, monitored by methadone clinics. And allegedly, its intentions was to detoxify a person addicted to chemical warfare off the, you know, off the methadone. Mm -hmm. We've seen that as a clear, clear process of taking from the revolutionary movements and the grassroots movements an ability to stay in touch with the community and to render aid and a, an ability and a setting mm -hmm. for a person to demonstrate their love for their brother and sister by spending time working with that brother and sister through that terrible period of cold turkey. Mm -hmm. well, it sounds like, it sounds like we need some of that out here today with all oh, this no crack question. out here, you know? But this is, this is why the method on maintenance move was a significant move. What happened is, is Rockefeller, uh, the history of methadone is a very interesting one. I don't know how much time we have, and I'm going to try to cut it short. Okay. But the methadone maintenance came into the community as a requirement for age-dependent children, a requirement if you wanted to get on welfare, <laughs> a requirement for parole, and requirement for probation. <laughs> it was called the Rockefeller Program in New York. At the time that Jimmy Carter was uh, 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 Jimmy Carter was governor of Atlanta, under him worked a man named Peter Bourne. Peter Bourne was the uh, National Drug Abuse Council coordinator for Richard Nixon. They brought methadone into the community. In, 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 in New York City, 60% of the illegal drugs on the streets in, during the uh, early 70s was methadone. So we could not blame drug addiction at that time on Turkey or, or Afghanistan or the rest of that triangle. Or the United States government. It was coming in from Eli, Eli Lilly and the Brinks trucks that was delivering the drugs to the various methadone clinics around the country. And instead of people being detoxified off of methadone, they were being increased in dosages. So acupuncture, in the hands of revolutionary thinking, Puerto Rican, black, progressive white people, was an intervention that the government was not willing to accept at the time because it attacked and exposed the intention of the government to expose, uh, to a, impose a chemical warfare on a certain segment of the community. Hmm. And it exposed the fact that the government wanted to control the flow of drugs into the community. So our, hello, yeah. our ability to get involved with acupuncture and to learn it, and to learn it from a very fundamental basis was an info important contribution to that struggle. Yeah. So we became victims of counterintelligence, not in the classical sense of, of based upon the Hoover document of stopping the rise of the black messiah or stopping the development of black nationalist hate groups that, that sold that famous 67 document. We became targets because we were intervening into the chemical war process here to then was being dealt with by illegal drugs and was being moved into the phase of legal drugs. Hmm. Now, now, that was... Uh when you were starting to get active with the Lincoln Detox Program, and could you tell us about some of the development that happened there and the development of Bonner? Okay. The Lincoln Detox Program was started by the Black Panther Party and the Young Lords Party and a white group called White Light. This group began to uh, take over aspects of Lincoln Hospital in order to provide space and a treatment care. Hello. 
Yeah, we're still here. For people, are you done with your call? No. Hmm. Hello? Hello? So, ladies and gentlemen, that's where we, uh, that's where we left off last week, or I should say two weeks ago, that was October 4th, uh, where, um, where there was, uh, just a interruption by the, uh, prison, uh, the prison, uh, telephone operator, and, uh, well, you know, as they say, the struggle must continue, and so we're going to continue on with Brother Mutulu. So, uh, welcoming you back to WHBK. Welcome back, Brother Matulu. Free land, brother. All right. <laughs> so it's uh, it's good to have you back. <laughs> yeah, well, it's all, like you say, the struggle always continues. Uh, you know, we just have to be prepared for the unexpected. It's our ability to handle the, uh, the strain that will uh, allow for us to win anyway, you know? Right. Okay, so now you were, you had been talking about um, two weeks ago. You were talking about the uh, the influx of drugs into the con- into the uh, country and into the uh, African community, the new African community. And uh, I was wondering if you could uh, uh, pick <laughs> kind of pick up the pieces from where you were two 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 weeks ago. Yeah. Um, hello. Yes. Okay. I hear someone messing with the phone. So bear with me. Okay. Um, I sure hope so. Okay. Um, I was trying to illustrate um, how the liberation movements and the civil rights movement and the black... Can you speak movement. up a little, brother? Hello? Can you speak up a little? Sure. Did, I was trying to illustrate how the civil rights movement and the black nationalist movement was very fundamental to us in the early 60s, late, mid-60s, and 70s. And that one of the ways that the organizations become fundamental, respected, and uh, appreciated from the masses is that we as organizational members or organization forms provide uh, some type of material aid to the uh, ills of our community and to the needs of our community. And so the uh, drug program in Lincoln Hospital uh, that was developed, as I said before, by the uh, Black Panther Party, Young Lords Party, and a and another formation called White Lightning uh, of ex-drug uh, uh, victims. This became a uh, center for revolutionary political change in the methodology and treatment modality of uh, drug addiction because mm-hmm. the method was not only quote, 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 medical, but it was also political. And I think that that was the continuing from the uh, independent basis that the various formations had prior to the 70s. Uh, various organizations, as I mentioned, the Nation of Islam, uh, uh, RAM and SNCC and other formations dealing with the problem themselves. So the Lincoln Detox became not only uh, recognized by the community as a political formation, but its work in developing and, and saving men and women of the third world inside of the oppressed communities, resuscitating these brothers and sisters and putting them into some form of healing process within the community, we became a threat to uh, the city of New York and consequently with the development of uh, the barefoot doctor acupuncture cadre, we began to move around the country and educate the country, uh, various other communities and set up schools and orientations around acupuncture, drug withdrawal, and the strategy of methadone, and the uh, teaching the brothers and sisters the fundamentals of acupuncture, the theory of acupuncture, how it was used in the revolutionary context in China and in Vietnam. Mm and how we were able to use it in the South Bronx and our success. Primarily because we had a love for our people and we had a commitment to our people, uh, we started very rudimentary. We started with just finger pressure points. And as we began to continue and search,
search for the truth, the information came to us. We went to China, we went to Montreal, we went around in England and Switzerland and various parts of the world to understand the theory and the application of acupuncture to drug withdrawal. So we became predictable. We became the uh, base of uh, acupuncturists who were revolutionaries in this country. Uh, most of us belonged to various political formations. And we were a part of a cadre of men and women who were not licensed uh, uh, Western doctors, but we were acupuncturists and oriental medicine. And so therefore we opened up a whole avenue of uh, the standards and the, and the oppression of AMA against uh, oriental medicine and the whole line of struggle. So acupuncture and Lincoln detox together was a political and medical threat to the theory of legalized chemical warfare within our community. Now that's, that's, that's deep because uh, the more I find out about you know how to take care of one's body, how to how to uh, get about get medical treatment, I mean, it seems like there was a, you know, a whole lot of uh, so many concepts involved in what you were doing, the AMA involved, and and the concept of Western medicine and pumping drugs into your system, and the and the tox and the uh, toxification of the community, the chemical warfare, um, it is. This is this is uh, a part of our history that I guess uh, very few of us have had access to. Now, but I wonder if you could you could also tell us a little bit about your uh, your case and exactly uh, how things came to a head and uh, how you wound up in prison. Uh, as, uh, one of the things that's got to be clear is that the, um, I am a part of a movement. I have been a part of the movement most of my life. Yeah, most of my life. And mm -hmm. I, when I became involved in the uh, Lincoln Detox process, I had already been uh, in the Republic of New Africa, the Black Caucus. I've been the supporter of the Ram cases in Queens, New York. I had also been involved in the National Black Political Convention. I, I was already a political animal. Mm -hmm. when, I, when, I, when we all hooked up in Lincoln Detox, there were major leaderships of the Young Lords Party that was a part of the, what we call the Lincoln Detox Collective. There, we were also a part of the National Committee for the Defense of Political Prisons. Some of us was a part of, some of the uh, North Americans were part of the Midnight Special. Uh, one of uh, the sister of Bernadine Dawn was, uh, Jennifer Dawn was uh, a part of the Lincoln Detox Collective. <laughs> so we had a number of politically conscious people involved in carrying out the fundamental process of the, dealing with the needs of the community. You follow me? Mm -hmm. And seeing with that there was too powerful of a of a access, a too too powerful access for the revolutionary community to have, especially as we were moving into 1973 and the oil uh, embargo and third world nations emerging around the world, mm -hmm. revolutionary struggle, the anti-imperialist struggle, struggle for national identity that was happening all over the world. Mm -hmm. The concept of self-determination within the minimum con context of community control and control of one's own health mm -hmm. was a too much of a significant barometer for our community to see the potential of freedom, the potential of self-determination, so we became a target. So it sounds like you're talking about the, a whole type of medical wing of the liberation movement almost like uh um uh the the various collectives that you were that you were talking about and i know here in chicago they had a, they had a brother who uh was involved uh with uh starting up a health clinic etc a whole new concept of of medicine medical care and how care should be provided it, w it really the principle of providing medical care wasn't new because if you remember the black panther party publicized people's health clinics. Right. They publicized it from the 60s to the early 70s. Mm -hmm. So, but, I mean, and the media publicized it. Other formations in the New Libyan movement in Cleveland and 
various uh, nationalist formations in New York and Chicago and in and, 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 and the Midwest and South were doing certain types of health care. In the voter registration campaign, they were doing certain things. Mm -hmm. But the, the significant part about this was is that we had also caught them red-handedly providing a chemical addiction to a people that they alleged was trying to detoxify mm. to clean up the drugs. So it wasn't only that we were providing medical care, we were providing medical care and exposing chemical warfare. We were not only providing medical care and exposing chemical warfare, we were challenging Western Occidental medicine to Eastern medicine and natural healing. So all the SADS and the health food stores and all of the reflexology clinics and all of these things that are allowed to function today would not exist if revolutionary men and women did not fight tooth and nail to spread the possibilities of another form of health care system to the third world grassroots community. Mm -hmm. And as you, as you were saying before, uh, we're, a lot of us are, are familiar somewhat with the history of the FBI, the CIA, COINTELPRO operations, uh, and the various uh, uh, um, search and destroy missions of various polit political, po uh, excuse me, police departments across the country. Um, and in New York, it was uh, particularly fierce, from what I understand. Oh, it was very significant. It was very significant. A lot of the, uh, the, 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 the thing that you have to understand is, one, people must read the COINTEL document directive clearly. Mm -hmm. And aspects of it talk about misdirecting, discredit discrediting, taking off track, taking away credibility, preventing good work from looking like good work in the community. Fundamental stuff. And that is strategic as opposed to overt. You follow me? Mm -hmm. And so suddenly they were beginning to, they couldn't come at us direct because it would be hard to explain. If men and women are trying to do something good, why are you attacking them? Mm -hmm. So therefore the misdirection and, 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 and the discrediting and uh, and the media's collaboration by refusing to announce to the community and to the readers what was going on allowed for the Lincoln Detox program to be targeted as if it was poverty pimps going on up there. They put out, at the time that we were moving, there was a group called the National Caucus of Labor Committee. Mm -hmm. They began to attack us. And now that we've seen their covert operations and understand them to be destabilizing and working for different forms all over the world, we realized that they were part of the covert action. Mm -hmm. uh, we were attacked by Charles Schumer, now a, a congressman in, in, in Washington. He was a congressman in Brooklyn. He led an, an, an assembly evaluation of all the so-called uh, uh, therapeutic programs. Which were residential communities where you could keep people in over a certain length of time and try to heal. Then he felt that we had too much control, that men and women had too much control over uh, 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 brothers and sisters without them being certified. And you know, certified men being politicized to the right wing element. So, Mayor Cox. Who, is, who became the mayor at the time was the head of the uh, New York City uh, 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 Board of Estimates. And so he led, he won his campaign on attacking drug programs and anti-poverty programs in New York City. <laughs> so during the end stages after they had murdered many BLA members, after they had had uh, tremendous trials and the Lincoln Detox community, the Lincoln Detox patients, the Lincoln Detox workers, the Lincoln Detox supporters were always in the eye of the storm when it came down to supporting revolutionary causes, positive issues. We striked when the uh, Dissicads went on strike. We struck with the workers, uh, the healthcare workers in the hospital. We demanded 
better health care. We fought in the welfare department for proper treatment of welfare recipients. We, we had a legal defense fund and helped in, indigenous people who couldn't afford uh, a legal services. These are the kinds of people services that was developed out of a revolutionary context from linking detox drug program as a result of politicizing victims of drug addiction and educating the community of chemical warfare, we were able to provide these types of community service. Therefore, as the, uh, the COINTELPRO and the media said that the liberation movement, they had broke the back of the liberation movement. Here in the South Bronx, under a different banner, under a health banner, we had cadres of men and women who were once the cause of the scourge of the community being now the heels in the community out there spreading the word of self-determination and liberation. So this is this is between the years of uh, we're in Lincoln Detox. That's from the years in seventy one to seventy eight, right? Yes. And now, uh, eventually, was Lincoln disbanded or what? what well, uh, the day that I was fired, they sent two hundred policemen uh, to the clinic, surrounded the clinic, two hundred well, policemen. Clinic, yes, and uh, just controlled the whole thing and, and fired all of us or told us that we were. Uh, uh, to be sent to other hospitals. Right now, today, you can go into uh, New York City, and in most municipal hospitals within the community, within the black and Puerto Rican and poor communities, the municipal hospitals, not the private hospitals, but the municipal hospitals, you can now receive acupuncture treatment for drug withdrawal as an alternative method of treatment. And that is that exists today because many men and women were put in jail, shot and killed, up all night, had mental disorder, all of the things that go with ongoing low intensity warfare, all the suffering that can be attributed to that as Fanon says. You will find the reason why men and women now can go get acupuncture and alternative health care has to do with that cadre of men and women. And they need to be praised, and that situation needs to be correctly analyzed. Because if we do not analyze it,
Um, you you were involved with with Bonner, right? Yes. Can Bonner you? was the Black Acupuncture Association of North America. Mm -hmm. We went into Harlem and we bought a home in um, Strivers Row and opened it as an acupuncture clinic in Harlem. Uh -huh. uh, and that clinic began to teach brothers and sisters and others uh, the skill of acupuncture to spread around the country in various segments of the, uh, uh, of the population. And we began to certify them internationally under, we were open under the International Association of Acupuncture and the World Health Organization. Mm -hmm. uh, because I have always been a revolutionary, I've always been uh, a supporter and a member of the liberation movement, um, nothing changes. The uh, acupuncture clinic was a clinic uh, and Banner was built on a similar uh, uh, structure as uh, a Lincoln Hospital. It was must be political and uh, any person who was going to learn from our uh, clinic had to be somewhat socially conscious and committed to the uh, fighting the ills of the community. And so acupuncture, uh, Banner became a target just like Lincoln Detox. Yeah. The only difference is, is that it was, it was easier to focus on Banner, to isolate Banner, uh, in order for them to deal with this raid on Banner that happened in uh, March of 1982. Banner became a target in a RICO conspiracy. What they allege is that because Banner was dividing this kind of health care and insurance companies was not giving money to Banner uh, because it was a part of another uh, uh, counterintelligence strategy to try to, to close us down by refusing to pay uh, rightfully due uh, insurance bills to the clinic. They alleged that the clinic was being kept alive by the Black Liberation Army. And they alleged that the Black Liberation Army was uh, robbing armored trucks in order to keep the acupuncture clinic alive, as well as other uh, other organizations and uh, facilities in the black nation. Mm -hmm. And so I became a target of an investigation. Uh, in uh, March 20th, I was indicted for the uh, liberation of Asada Shakur uh, because I was a legal ed, uh, uh, assistant and many of her cases all during the 70s. Uh, they they targeted me with uh, her liberation. I was targeted as uh, part of uh, the liberation of other freedom fighters, and as well as the expropriation of uh, nine or ten army trucks during the course of uh, '76 to '81. So I am in. Uh, I was. I went underground in 1970. I mean, 1981. Uh, I knew I was a target. Untahari Sundiata Shabaka was murdered. A great revolutionary by the name of Sekou Odinga, who had been a part of the Panther 21 case, who had been a childhood friend of mine, who had, uh, was the leader of the Black Panther Party, who had went to Algiers and opened up the international section, was captured at the time Muntahari was uh, murdered, and he was on trial. He, began, he was indicted for being uh, the lead, one of the leaders of the clandestine formation of the Black Liberation Army, New African Freedom Fighters. Uh, many other brothers and sisters, uh, Kwesi Balagoon, Chewy Ferguson L, uh, Asada Shakur, uh, Nahande Dibidun, great sister who was a part of the above ground structure, who is still on the ground, who is still being hunted by the, um, the law, uh, the FBI, the CIA, Interpol. She was a sister who helped start Banner in, uh, on 139th Street between 7th and 8th Street, 7th and 8th Avenue in Harlem. She was a great sister. She was a part of the Rev Republic of New Africa's cadre and was one of the first organizers of the New African People's Organization. Many people know of Asada Shakur, and, and, and they should, but there are many. Uh, there's another sister named Nahanda Dibidun that they have been hunting and trying to catch ever since we went underground. Sure. And she's a great comrade, a great sister, and our sisters need to know about her. She was a, a, a very important contributor to the uh, development of acupuncture and drug withdrawal in the black community, the New African community. So we uh, felt the wrath of COINTELPRO. Uh, we were also, uh, prior to and during the time of the Lincoln detox process, my political work was the National Committee 
uh, for the defense of political prisoners and the uh, National COINTELPRO Litigation and Research Committee. Mm -hmm. Now that, that formation was made up of various political formations and organizations who had suffered during the decline of the revolutionary movement who were, these formations were victims of counterintelligence and COINTELPRO and low intensity warfare. We came together to try to find out why we of political formations such as, such as the African People's Party, the Republican New Africa, All African People's Revolutionary Party, uh, 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 the black uh, segments of the Black Panther Party, segments of the House of Emoja, how come we could not sit down and, 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 and unite and further the struggle for human rights of New African people in America and, mm -hmm. and, and for a socialist development of our struggle? And that discussion and those people coming together made us realize that we had not thoroughly understand, understood and accepted low intensity warfare and counterintelligence in relationships to the ideological struggles that we were having, so-called petty contradictions between ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so that committee became the National, Commi uh, National, uh, National Committee for the uh, uh, COINTELPRO Co Litigation and Research. And what we did was begin to go out and look at issues that were dividing us. Excuse me, brother. Give, give, give us an idea of what time period you're talking about right now. Now we're talking between 73 and 77. Okay. I just wanted to get that. Right. right. We're talking about after Sada Shakur was uh, captured uh -huh. and Zaid Malik was killed and Shakur was killed and mm -hmm. Sundiata Kohli was captured. Okay. Okay. Because between 70 and 73, there was complete assassination of BLA members. It was assassination of, of, of potential organizers within above ground formation. Mm -hmm. There was also uh, 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 false charges and Martin Sarge all over the country. Men and women were falling to all kinds of various situations. Now this happened somewhat different than the 67 to, uh, well, let's say 66, because we have to put in Ahmed Evans and, and what happened in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. uh, from the 66 to the 70 period, where the consensus of the, uh, of the police and the FBI and the white community was that direct attacks against visible fronts of the black liberation movement was legal and proper. You follow me? Yeah. So that many uh, organizations who had uh, storefronts who were providing various care and office open to the community were being militarily attacked. You follow me? Yeah. And those attacks began to kill the momentum of the visibility of liberation formations within the community. Mm -hmm. So after they confronted us in that fashion, from 70 to 71, the low intensity hunt and destroy methods was the second phase of COINTEL. Mm -hmm. And us killing each other. I mean, a lot of people, I think a lot of people uh, in the audience, uh, uh, wonder what low intensity uh, warfare is, but uh, uh, in terms of clear clearing it up, it's the same tactics that the United States government used against Chile, used against El Salvador, and uses in, around the world uh, to destabilize governments uh, and uh, in here in the United States to destabilize the uh, African community, the uh, uh, Native American communities, the Puerto Rican, the uh, 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 island of Puerto Rico, etc., etc., etc. And uh, it's, it's, it's nothing spooky about it. Exactly. I think a lot of times we put titles on things to cut the explanation. Right. And where we need to put the explanation, make the explanation more clear. Low intensity warfare is very simply put, is to play on the weaknesses and uncovered flanks of organizations that are a threat, or formations that are a threat to the powers to be or to your adversary. Mm. As it relates to us, and the United States government and military government, we, the liberation movements, were infiltrated with agents, money was stolen and we would begin to accuse each other. Work that we were doing to educate and propagate to the community was being subverted and converted because we did not control the media process. Mm -hmm. Our own egos was being used against us very fundamentally. Mm -hmm. uh, 
your mail was being stolen when you expected the mail to come from this, that, or the other. Shoestring budgeted, budgets was being stretched to the limit so that we would fail to make certain deadlines. So we began to feel inconsistent, impotent, incompetent, and we felt that the things were falling apart. So our m morale began to weaken. And so, we, with a weak morale and a vicious military attack, an assassination of a key leader, or a car accident driving them off the road, or an addiction be, uh, of, a, of, a, of a, a, a supporter, or something, anything that can break down the fundamental structure and the spirit of a formation is low-intensity warfare, where you're being attacked every day, but it's not the clear lines that you anticipate. And it's not haphazard attack. It's a very fundamental, thought-out, programmatic attack at the weaknesses that have been reported by the agent to the superior. Okay, now, uh, and you experienced a lot of that, as you were just saying, in your, uh, in your, in, in Bana and in the, uh, in the uh, detox, the Lincoln detox. And as a matter of fact, one of your fellow doctors uh, was... Uh, was killed or died on the, on the scene? Or? Well, Lincoln Detox was a hotbed for COINTELPRO. Mm -hmm. uh, during the time, then from 71, 70 to 77, we suffered at least three or four assassinations. Mm -hmm. The most notable assassination, if you remember we were talking about the fact that we had, uh, uh, we were unlicensed in, AMA, in Western medicine, but licensed in Eastern medicine? Yes. Well, during the time that we were licensed in Eastern medicine and, and, and practicing acupuncture, the only way that we were able to maintain and continue was that we had a Western doctor to support the work program. He was the sign-off person. Okay. This person was not necessarily have to be an acupuncturist. Matter of fact, they prefer he not be or she not be. And during the course from 70 to 73, initially it was a man by the name of Frank, one was Steve Levine, was the first uh, doctor at Lincoln Hospital, but he was not an acupuncturist. A man by the name of Frank Atfeld, uh, MD, was one of the first Western medicine uh, doctors working with the cadre. We evolved the acupuncture collectively together. He left, and there was a man by the name of, uh, his name was Richard Taft. Now, Richard Taft was the grandson of President Taft, or the great-grandson of President Taft. When Richard Franklin Asheville left, Richard Taft was the resident doctor okaying the Western, the Eastern treatment modality. You follow me? Yes. And so, therefore, he was essential to us in terms of continuing treatment. Okay. At the day, the day he was murdered, Two days before he was murdered, Charles Schumer and the National Caucus of Labor Committee created an attack, a verbal media attack as well as a mass rally to create a diversion of energy from the Lincoln Detox Program. The day he was killed, the night he was killed, they had just attacked our clinic physically. And anyone in the, in the over historical period would know that the National Caucus uh, National Caucus Labor Committee had brown shirt type tactics. They would just jump on the people, beat them with noon chuckers. That was their, mo you know, modus of operandi, right? Mm -hmm. And so the day Richard Taft was killed, Peter Bourne, who was, who was Reagan's, I mean, I'm sorry, Carter's, East Coast Regional Campaign Manager, and the survey of the international uh, acupuncture uh, uh, availability for drug addiction came to the clinic he was the one he was there when Richard Taft's body was killed and if you want to know who Richard Bourne was I mean uh, uh, Bourne his father was the person in Grenada who owned the American Medical University over there who called in the troops saying that the Americans was under attack so, his son was there the same day that the grandfather of Richard Tab, grandson of Richard Tab, was murdered. Now, the murder was he was shot up with drugs in the back of the auditorium. That's how he died. Hmm. 
So that was to discredit the acupuncture clinic as if the doctors of the clinic was drug addicts. Right, right. That he OD'd. And now, even if you accept the fact that he used drugs, which we don't, why would he use it in the back of the auditorium mm -hmm. and die? Mm -hmm. Very shaky circumstances. Mm -hmm. Another great man that was killed associated with the Lincoln Detox Program was a man by the name of Stanley Cohen, a fantastic lawyer. This man had won every case that we had had from Lincoln Detox, BLA cases, cases dealing with uh, rights as welfare uh, clients, uh, workers' rights. He had defended the Simon Shakur through three major trials. We were getting ready to go into Jersey for the last and final trial because the Simon Shakur was never convicted of the things that they allegedly were looking for her for. She was convicted for defending herself against an assassination plot on the New Jersey Turnpike, which killed my brother Zay Shakur and imprisoned Sundiata Kohli. Mm -hmm. That last trial, just before we were going into that last tri trial, they found Stanley Cohen uh, OD on cocaine. He was the best attorney that the clinic had and that the revolutionaries had at that time. Not famous like the rest of them. Okay. Um, now, uh, we've, covered, we've covered so much. It's been so fascinating. Um, no, it, the, the reason why I'm covering all of this is because when you read about me in the big dance or you read about uh, my POW position in the courts and, and the stand I take on international law as it relates to our struggle, when I say that I'm a prisoner of war, I'm talking about low-intensity warfare. I'm talking about a warfare that has been sanctioned as legitimate war by the Protocols 1 and 2 of the International UN Convention. You follow me? Yeah. And I'm saying that we have to recognize that our suffering cannot be passed off as criminal, follow me, violations. I am a part of a liberation movement. I accept that. I accept the fact that the United States government has waged war on us as a people. And I believe that my actions are part of resistance to that war. Consequently, I am captured as a prisoner of war. You follow me? Yes. And so when I tell you what the war is like, when I talk to you about acupuncture, and I talk to you about healing, and I talk to you about legal work, and I talk to you about welfare work, that work is work that must be considered war work. You follow me? Right. Because if we are to save ourselves, we must be clear about what we're dealing with. The unclarity creates the confusion. You follow me? Right. And so I give you this whole background because when you t read about me or when they say things, I mean, most of the time they don't like talking about me because they can't make me a classic criminal. Mm -hmm. They can't make me a petty thief. Mm -hmm. You see, they have to deal with the whole. You can't deal with the part. And so when you talk, when we talk about all the freedom, like Abdul Majid of the Queens too and Bassir, these men worked on housing. They worked to, for, for better housing in, the, in areas like Chicago and New York and Detroit and, and, and Philadelphia and Boston. We know what it is to have hot water flats. We know what it is to have rats and roaches and, and, and the landlord not coming in taking care of that. More tropical areas might not understand the significance of fighting landlords and, and, and slum lords. You follow me? Mm -hmm. But these brothers, well, that's the work they did in the community. And so now they, they are in jail fighting for a new trial for allegedly killing a policeman. You got Mamir in Philadelphia, who was, a, who was a radio personality, a person who dealt with the media, who gave the news, who dealt with the arts of African people, new African people. He's getting ready. They're trying to execute him for defending himself against a policeman. Now, how can you execute a political prisoner, a prisoner of war? You can't do that and not violate the treaties of war. When you look at what's going on at ANC and the Pretoria government right now, the release of prisoners, the phases of release of prisoners, and this is why we must save Mamiya, 
Because if we allow him, allow them to kill Mamiya, execute Mamiya, all of our future will be executed in pursuit of political struggle when in other countries prisons of war are put in prison detention camp and saved until the negotiation happens. Mm. Well, I find that in this country, most people uh, say prisoners of war. Well, you must be talking about uh, those people that uh, Ross Perot is talking about, or somebody, you know, or something like that. There aren't any prisoners, prisoners of war, political prisoners in this country, and uh, I think that's part of the, the myth that we have to dispel. Well, it's, it's, it's a myth. is because our movements, our people who deal with the media, do not interpret our situations properly. Mm. So sure, if there's only one war that people know about, the war against Saddam Hussein, <laughs> then that's the only war that they're going to refer to. Mm -hmm. you know, the war against drugs, or uh, 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 Noriega, mm -hmm. then that's the only war they're going to refer to. Mm -hmm. So we have to understand, and we, we can't charge genocide, we can't charge reparations, if we don't realize that we can't say at the same time that the existence of new African people is a warlike existence inside an oppressive colonized situation. Yes. You know, um, uh, it seems to me that uh, along with the concept of uh, being at war is the concept of nationhood. And uh, when we talk about the concept, the concept of nationhood uh, in, in context of black people, of new African people, we're talking about uh, a, a, a land base on this country, and I would want, I wonder if you would tell us, um, just if you could just elaborate for me how through how through your struggle you came to uh, become a new African. I mean, what what compelled you? What what were, what were the things that compelled you to be to uh, identify yourself as such? Let me just say this. You can't put the heart before the horse, the cart before the horse. Okay. Right? Yeah. The issue is, are we at a state of conflict? If we're at a state of conflict, what is going to be the solution? Okay. So you have to first accept there's a conflict. If you don't accept there's a conflict, then you can't fathom a separate nation. And if you do, it's egotistical. Well, I want my own. It's without basis. But if you understand that we do not coexist in a vacuum, that we are in a life and death struggle, that the history of us being brought here and how we're treated since we've been here demands that we come up with some formula to resolve this contradiction or else our condition, our condition and our circumstances might be the cause of the fall of all humanity on the planet Earth. Because we must be free. Now, everybody doesn't agree with that scenario. <laughs> You follow me? Yeah, that's true. Some people believe that we can formulate a better living and life condition by participating in an integrated political and economic system, cultural system. Uh -huh. Now, I do not say that they're not revolutionaries. If they are hell-bent on changing this system, and changing the, 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 the rights of people and forcing this government and, and developing a new government that integrates everybody into a, 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 a equal formation and rights for everybody, well then, all praises due to Allah, fine. It still does not deal with the question, where do we find ourselves as new African people brought here as slaves, mm -hmm. okay? Right. But even in that society, I will coexist because you can you allow me to ha have my own culture or at least try to find where I'm going. You follow me? Yes. But I contend that that utopia or that possibility for the last 150 years has not come to be. And in the process, we have been dying, 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 dying. And in order for us to 
understand what it is that we were fighting for, we must label what we're fighting for. And I'm fighting for a nation, a nation of new African people, not exclusively, but conclusively our nation that develops a culture that deals with our experience and that a culture that will allow the, the, the exercise of creativity, uh, the potential of every man, woman, and child that enters our nation. So I come to that because I understood that I have to know why I'm fighting and might die, why I sacrifice. Okay. People come to it for different reasons. You mm -hmm. follow me? Yeah. And okay. so we can intellectualize it. We can talk about what Malcolm talked about, that all struggle is fought for land. The Turkish struggle, the struggle that you see in, in, in Europe, in, in the so world Soviet Union, is a struggle for national identity. That the, mm -hmm. the different nations in the Soviet Union feel that they must have their own land base, they must make their own decisions and formulate their own policies as it relates to other peoples in the world. And that was the mighty Soviet Union. So are you saying that that is not possible in America? And if it is possible, it's going to be a war of Armageddon? Hmm. Well, I might agree with you. But it does not take away from the fact that you must know why you're fighting and why you're sacrificing and why you might die. Okay. You can't be vague about that. Because okay. what we're struggling for is the control of the re natural resources. And what you saw in, the, in, 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 uh, in Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Iraq was a struggle to take a piece of the natural resources that has escaped the U.S. imperialist powers because of the emergence of territorial nationalism. Okay. Now, let me ask you... Uh, let me ask you this. Um, I've heard about the Shakur family. I mean, uh, I've heard a, I've heard a lot of beautiful, positive things about it. I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about how that, what that family is, or that that um, connection is. Could you? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's out of curiosity. I've just heard a little bit about it. The Shakur family stems from a man by the name of Abba Saladin Shakur. Abba Saladin Shakur was responsible for fathering the Mumu Shakur, Zayd Malik Shakur, myself, Asada Shakur, Sekou Adinga, Abdul Majid, Malika, Majid, and many other new Africans who were part of the, new, the Republic of New Africa and the Black Panther Party. And we were of the Shakur tribe. A very, Albert Shakur was one of the loyal members of uh, the OAU and the Muslim Moss Incorporated and a close associate of uh, Brother Malika El Shabazz. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I, I understand that Brother Tupac Shakur yes. is, uh, <laughs> is uh, raising some consciousness through his records. As a matter of fact, I've heard, heard his last record. It was great. Yeah. Tupac is my son. Oh, well, great. No and kidding. he is being attacked by the powers to be uh -huh. because of his own individuality, uh -huh. his own method and ways of demonstrating um, how our lives, the absence of his extended family, me, the Mumba, they, his mother, a great woman, our family she called, one of the uh, only two women in the Panther 21 case who defended herself during the Panther 21 case. Mm -hmm. At one, she was also a very key figure in the national uh, pro and tell pro litigation and research formulation 
a fantastic worker against housing, and one of the key supporters of political prisons and prison war during the 70s. We understand that our children, and a lot of things that men, you know, it's interesting you would bring that up, because <laughs> we've just been talking to me and the family about how we're going to handle the quail confrontation. Let us be very clear. It is always admirable to have your children believe what you believe. Uh -huh. It's always the legacy you'd like to continue. You feel like you commit yourself, your sacrifices, yeah. so that they will know. And we have many children, many of our children. The ex-clan is uh, uh, Sonny Carson's son, Brother Lumumba, <laughs> a great comrade. We grew all, this is all our family. But they all have seen what low-intensity war means. My other son, little Matula, is involved in the Tony, was involved in the Tony, Tony, Tony thing. Now him and his, his brother are together. <laughs> no kidding. Yeah. But what we see is that many of our children suffer in ways that is yet to be analyzed from the intensity of the war that we have been struggling against. And because our community has not accepted that as a reality, and because we're in jail, we're not able to give our family what you might give, not you personally, but what they might be able to do in the confounds of their home and, and expounding the culture and going back to the Egyptology and the history of the Nile and the great cultural lessons that our children are getting, they always seem to forget to give the real or research the struggle, the contemporary struggle that a major part of our people played a part in in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Hmm. And because we forget that, our children, who are directly connected to the intensity of the war, are constantly evaluating the consequences. Hmm. I see. And the way that they respond to the repression, oppression, sometimes not might not be what we want them to do. But we we have begun to understand what the residue of war means. Just like the people and the fathers and mothers in Angola whose children have been shooting their mothers and shooting their fathers at the orders of Zimbabwe. Just like in South Africa where neck laces was required to rid the townships of informants. Hmm. Just like the killings and beatings of young kids that are in the ANC and PAC. We will have to see in another generation how that has affected, after the Soweto riots, how that did that affect the masses of people. Are we immune to life and death? Does that mean we lose our passion for living? Is that why we see the killing of old ladies and the drive-by shootings of innocent children and, and the, the lyrics you know, explaining phenomena heretofore not connected to the principles of our community. We must make that analysis. And when you make that analysis, I think that the audience will agree that we have a serious problem, and you cannot call it genetic, like they're trying to evaluate our children and say that we're violence-prone. Mm -hmm. And if we allow that, you're going to allow the gas chambers. Right. If you allow every child to be fingerprinted and footprinted, you're going to allow the gas chambers. Mm. If you do not understand that the Tuskegee experiment about the sex and, and, and allowing men to walk around with syphilis for 30 and 40 years, and then we come up with AIDS, if you don't see it, I mean, you know, <laughs> I right. mean, you know. Yeah, what can you say? It's nothing. <laughs> so, you know, we all go to the next level with a different understanding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You see, so, yeah, those are our children. And, uh, you know, uh, KRS-1 and, and MC Light and, yeah. and all of the rappers, uh, Brother P 
Prince and all of these people are yelling out what they see as a political reality. Okay. But for lack of a structure, and you have to accept the fact that Minister Farrakhan and the Nation of Islam are overtly courting and supporting Ice T and Ice Cube, and, and rightfully they should. They should. And I thought you got to admire that. Mm -hmm. But we must do the same. Right. Not we meaning separate from the nation of Islam, but a non-religious formation must clearly embrace and support and protect the griot of the youth of the day. Wow. You know, it's been, uh, it's been just fantastic having you on the air. And uh, I really hope we can do this again sometime. Um, it's been... You know, we talk, we, I, I talk about uh, it on the air sometimes, talk about the history that you didn't get from Eyes on the Prize. <laughs> oh, no question. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But it's a good foundation. Mm -hmm. It's a good foundation. I think what is missing from the Eye on the Prize is the filler. Mm -hmm. what, how did Willie Ricks get to, you know, uh -huh. black power? And, and how did the struggle between SNCC develop? And, and, you know, how did, how did uh, uh, the, the love that you've seen between Martin and Kwame Torre, even though they disagree yeah. tactically, yeah. I think it's important to see that when the deacon's defense for defense was securing the men and women marching from, Mon uh, to, uh, from, Mon uh, from Montgomery to Mississippi, that they were being protected by the deacons for the defense. Mm -hmm. That was a capitulation on Martin's behalf that security was needed at some point. Right. So everybody was growing, you know? It, it's an evolutional process, right. and we have to analyze that. One of the things that it made clear is that we had to clearly define what it is we want. Nonviolence cannot be an objective. It can be a strategy, but it can't be an objective. Okay, brother. Um, well, we're about to sign off right now because I'm about to run out of time in about two minutes. If uh, there was, a, if there's any final message that you'd like to shout out to the Chicagoland uh, audience and uh, whoever else this may go out to. Uh, yes, I just like to say that I've met some great men that just come out of Chicago that yeah. have been in prison. It's my first time in prison. Um, I think that. Uh, we need to, all the communities need to come closer together. I think that we have to realize that we must support our political prisons. We must internationalize our support for our political prisons. We must make that a requirement for our support for other, for other causes. Because all other causes support their political prisons. It is not sufficient for the whole half of America to raise up for Nelson Mandela and not raise up for Sekou Adunga and Mumir uh, Abu-Jamal and, 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 and the rest, or uh, Geronimo Pratt. Right. You, we must see our struggle in its proper context. And we must see the severity of it. And we must have more love for each other, and we must stop being afraid to be in the community offering the solution hmm. and deal with it completely and decisively. All right, brother. It's been good having you on there. Okay. Free the land. Free the land and the man. Yeah. All right. Okay, right. Bye-bye. All right, brothers and sisters. That was sure inspirational. Man, some type of history, huh? I'm going to be clearing the airways here now for uh, Sister, um, Sister Chris. She's about to come in the studio and uh, do what she does best. You got her on a new time slide now, right? Yeah. That's right. Uh, we land.